Once more, thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. And once more from the top, Raycon earbuds like these right here, their Everyday E25 lineup, are great quality Bluetooth earbuds that first off start at about half the price as other premium earbuds in the market, so you're saving some cash from the get-go, and they still sound great. Celebrities and musicians like Melissa Etheridge, Snoop Dogg, Rich the Kid, and Mike Tyson swear by them, and I trust the man who can kill me in a single punch. <laughs> There's more than a handful of colors, so pick something to match your preferred aesthetic, and their sleek, compact design fits good in the ears, giving you a great noise-isolating fit. They last about six hours on a single charge, but you can also charge the carrying case itself to give you up to 24 hours of additional playtime while you're on the go. Throughout the past year, I've been rocking them while doing DDP yoga and losing weight without the rest of the neighborhood hearing DDP scream at me. But when Arrow sucks, for the record, just wanted to say that, and you can save 15% off your order today by visiting the link in the description below, buyraycon.com slash somecallmejohnny. There's also a 45-day free return policy so you can make sure you find the right pair for yourself without breaking the bank. Consider picking up a pair today, please do take care of yourself, and now, on with the show. Yeah, I figured why not. Crash 4 is coming out this week, and Wrath of Cortex and Twin Sanity already put me back in a Crash Bandicoot mood, and I thought it wouldn't take much time to look at some of Crash's handheld adventures. So as Crash was going multi-platform, he also jumped to the Game Boy Advance with Crash Bandicoot The Huge Adventure, Crash Bandicoot 2 Entranced, and Crash Purple Ripto's Rampage, the first Crash games developed by Vicarious Visions, who would later take the wheel for the Insane Trilogy, as I mentioned in that video. Though these three are often grouped together as a trilogy because they all share the same developer, for this video, I'm just going to be looking at Huge Adventure and Entrance, since I think it would be more appropriate to look at Crash Purple, along with Spyro Orange together in a separate video, since those two are meant to be played together. And you know, when I actually give Spyro some love, which I still haven't done to this day, I have my reasons. Well, reason. But I'll save that for another time. Alright, well first up is Crash Bandicoot The Huge Adventure, also known as Crash Bandicoot XS in Europe. This is one I actually have some memory experiencing when it was new. It was one of the first titles I played when testing out Game Boy Advance emulation when I started to experiment with all that stuff for the first time. I didn't finish it then, I can't recall why, but we're going all in for it today, so let's get started. Once again, we see Dr. Cortex and Uka Uka groaning over their past failures involving world domination in Crash Bandicoot. Cortex, however, has a secret weapon up his sleeve, again, and instead of just making another Bandicoot, he just decides to shrink the whole planet. Doesn't put it in a bottle, which is what I thought was going to happen next, you know, Cortex taking a page from Brainiac. But no, Cortex just shrinks the world and then points and laughs at it, basically. So Aku Aku then tells Crash to stop Cortex's current scheme by traveling the world and collecting power crystals. Straight into the point, I guess, Huge Adventure wastes no time. This setup is odd, because besides giving Crash another excuse to collect crystals, the entire planet being shrunken down means absolutely nothing. With a name like the Huge Adventure, you know, staring at the box art, seeing a humongous Cortex reaching ominously towards Crash, you would think that the game would elicit a certain design philosophy, like, say, Giant Land from Mario 3, or Tiny Huge Island from Mario 64, or shit, even something like like Toy Story, where even the most innocent of objects can prove to be hazardous obstacles because of your smaller size. However, since the entire planet was affected, this means everything is pretty much the same as it was before. The European name XS is more accurate, I suppose. I mean, the world did shrink, but it doesn't mean anything. Environments are the same, bosses are the same, everything's the same, which is a fairly good way of summing up the huge adventure. Much like Sonic Pocket Adventure, forever my go-to comparison for these sort of things, the huge adventure is mainly a means of taking previous Crash games and just putting them on the Game Boy Advance, particularly Crash Bandicoot 2 in Huge Adventure's case, and Trance takes a lot more from Crash 3, but we'll get to that game in a second. We've seen this song and dance number a million times already on this channel. It's all economical in execution without much effort being placed in originality. There's not much new that Huge Adventure or Entrance brings to the table. If it's not the exact same beats from other games, there's slightly tweaked variations that offer something more unique, but nothing terribly different than before. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, especially if it works just as well as last time, something I think Wrath of Cortex kind of fumbled with. But it should be double, triple emphasized that Huge Adventure and Entrance are nothing you haven't seen already. Even most of the music is taken from other games, though the compositions are still good. The Game Boy Advance did them justice, I think. And that said, though, aesthetically it is all familiar familiar, it is still based on a fundamentally good structure. It's old school Crash, and those games were, and still are, great. 
There's only four worlds, but there's five stages apiece, each containing a crystal to collect, and there's gems you can nab by breaking all the boxes or finding secret routes. And for added value, there's also the returning time relics to help increase your completion rating and getting the best ending. At the end of every world, there's a boss waiting for you, and beating them grants you a power-up like before, all taken from Crash 3 except the bazooka. So there's the super belly flop, the double jump, the death tornado spin, and the crash dash for easier relic hunting. The whole game is 2D though, and that shouldn't be too surprising given the hardware. And on a surface level basis, if we're just talking about the basic stuff like the looks and controls and what have you, it's not that bad. We've seen these level tropes before, but I think they transitioned quite well in the Game Boy Advance. There's lots of colors, and the detail is great. However, I can also argue that there's a little too much detail, to the point of level design being a little busy. It does help make the levels feel as organic as they were previously, but it is surprisingly easy to lose track of important objects, like nitro detonators, boxes in general, I would say. Let me see, hazards, enemies especially, like the Cortex goons, they just blend with their surroundings in some stages, and there goes a life suddenly missing. Hit detection is also a little scuffed. Sometimes I can spin into things just fine, other times it doesn't work and I die. Kinda hard to kill things when that happens. I felt that the most with these jellyfish in the swimming stages and everything that was being thrown at me in the flying stages. For these, it's more of a perception issue with me, but I nevertheless found it troublesome to get an idea of how to properly dodge obstacles and break boxes here. It's a two-dimensional game trying to simulate a three-dimensional space, but instead of polygons, it's sprites, which don't have that one-to-one -one precision needed to help you move precisely. There's not much screen crunch though, thankfully, but the chosen resolution for the game does lead to some leaps of faith, and the graphical layouts for platforms and boxes make it a little hard for me to gauge my landings when I need to make more precise jumps. I have to keep reminding myself, all right, John, you gotta remember the platform ends here and not here. Don't fall off again like a damn dope. And this is more of a preference thing, but a part of me wishes they didn't go with the whole pre-rendered sprite setup. It's fine, I don't think it's ugly, but I would've preferred something a little more pixel-centric. Blowing up the screen resolution doesn't really help matters either, though that's not really the game's fault. It's not like it was designed with bigger screens in mind, but it is something to consider if you're gonna play this on like a Game Boy player on GameCube or emulator. If you can, I would recommend playing this on actual hardware, a GBA or a Nintendo DS Lite, just to make it easier on the eyes. Crash feels responsive and his arsenal skills work almost as well here as they did on the PlayStation, though yes, notice my choice of wording, I said almost because no, it's not perfect. Not bad, but not quite the same. The slide jump. Yeah, I'm opening that wound again, kind of happy with me, I'm aware. It's better than twin sanity, I can say that now, it's much more snappy. But if you try and perform it too close to the edge of a platform, you just clumsily slide off the damn thing and you can't really jump cancel out of it. Not a lot because of that shit. Platforming can get really tight in Huge Adventure, and slide jumps along with Death Tornado spins was always my way of getting through them. But as much as I would want that, not always the best option here. You're better off just using the classic double jump when the game decides to let you use it anyway. I don't know, man. The double jump in Crash 3 was quirky at points, yes. You couldn't trigger it if you were past the apex of the first jump. The same could be said about it here, but sometimes the game just doesn't register the jump at all, and I don't know if it's my inputs being eaten, a controller issue. God, I hate explaining control issues. They're so finicky, and I'm never sure what's to blame. And it doesn't stop there, because even the Death Tornado spin has similar issues. You know how it goes. You can use it to extend your attack, or you can use it in midair to extend your jump. In Crash 3, that felt so good to take shortcuts or glide over hazards. I think you can do that in Huge Adventure, but honestly, I'm not sure because the thing rarely fucking works. Either the game isn't reading my button mashing, or they want me to mash the fuck out of this button because sometimes that ended up working, and other times it didn't. Or you get scenarios like this where I found myself floating in midair without mashing at all. I'm pressing nothing on the controller during this, but it's pretty freaky. I wish I could do this at will. But uh, I only recall needing the Death Tornado glide once or twice throughout the whole game for gem collection, so I guess I can say it's a good thing that you're not required to use it just to beat the game, but goodness, I just wish it weren't so awkward. It didn't take me terribly long to run through the huge adventure, ironically enough. It was around three and a half hours, I want to say, including time trials, which you have to do in order to unlock the true ending. It's a weird one, too. You fix the planet up, but then Cortex and his goons get combined into this abomination. And the final boss, if you can call it that, is a standard chase level. Like, you don't even directly fight this thing. I don't think that's been done up to this point, so I can give huge adventure that. But this all directly leads into the sequel, Entrance, taking place almost immediately after the end of Huge Adventure. So Uka Uka is fed up again, he can't rely on Cortex anymore, so instead, he asks the returning nefarious Troby to aid him on his quest for world domination. Entropy is more than willing to oblige, so he enlists the aid of this egg-shaped dude named Entrance, a master hypnotist, and they work together to kidnap Coco and Crunch from their home and brainwash them to do their bidding, for about two minutes anyway, and they try to kidnap Crash as well, but Aku Aku manages to save him at the last second, and instead the villains end up accidentally sucking in fake Crash instead. That's a weird time to suddenly make fake crash a thing, but okay then, so fake crashes in this game. 
But that's the setup. Your friends are kidnapped and brainwashed, and you gotta collect crystals to not only rescue them, but to also stop entropy and entrance. Level progression is more like Super Mario Bros. 3 or Super Mario World. You can't pick any level you want in each world anymore. You have to do certain levels beforehand. It's a departure from before, but I think it's small potatoes. You have less freedom over progression, yes, but it's a smaller game. They want to change it up a bit. And in this case, losing the hub isn't that big of a deal to me. I'm okay with this setup. The game is just more of the same from Huge Adventure, really. You can put them side to side and I couldn't tell them apart from a glance. But Entrance does change a few things, some for the better and some for the worst, I feel. Besides having the double jump by default now, most of Crash's power-ups after beating bosses are brand new. An extra long slide that can help speed things along at the risk of colliding with a TNT or Nitro crate like a dumbass, and there's also this super high jump. Your momentum is next to zilch when doing it, and you can't do anything else until you land, but... It can help you get across some areas when down below is not exactly safe. That said, these new skills are seldom used. They're more for 100% completion, and even then, I found them rarely used there as well. The concepts are sound. On paper, they're great, but the game doesn't take full advantage of them, so I feel there's not much else to talk about. As mentioned before, aesthetically Entrance borrows a lot from Crash 3 this time, and I guess Wrath of Cortex 2 by proxy. Like, they also brought in the rollerball here. I'm sorry, the Atlasphere from Wrath of Cortex. Oh my god. <laughs> what is with that 3D bottle of Crash? I don't know why I find that so funny seeing them like that. I mean, the controls are fine, the levels are okay, death perception could be a little better. Hard to tell what I can fall off from sometimes. <laughs> I don't, man, I'm easy to please. I don't know why I find that so funny to look at. Well, there is more of an attempt here to make Entrance stand out than just being a Crash 2 and 3 clone, even if it still is for about 70% of it. You got these stages where you're skiing away from a giant shark and... That pre-rendered water looks hokey as shit. They're the chase levels though, so you should know what to expect from these. A couple of times you control Coco in these space levels, and I don't know what the hell to make of these, or her profile picture in the level so like, does she have a concussion? I did smack her pretty hard during the boss fight. You're going to jail, Crash Bandicoot. So you're tethered to this satellite contraption, I think. And in terms of movement, that's what you're controlling, not Coco, the satellite. So there's a slight delay to everything you do and positioning is awkward because though you're controlling the satellite, it's Coco you have to make sure doesn't take damage from hazards and projectiles. You're running away from this inferno behind you, but that's not really an issue as you can boost for a sudden burst of speed as many times as you want. These aren't as jank as the space level in Wrath of Cortex or the jetpack now that I think about it. I didn't find myself suddenly dying for no reason, but it wasn't very fun as an idea altogether. Crystals are still the main thing to collect just for the sake of completing the story, and there's also still box gems and time relics, but Entrance also gives us these gem shards. In essence, they're just replacements for the color gems. Well, you're collecting them to build color gems to be more precise, but as far as collectibles go, they're relatively straightforward. Getting them just requires that you find the secret route in the given stage and then hunt them down, which is not always easy to do, as Entrance is just as guilty with the Leap of Faith shit as Huge Adventure was. In fact, I think Entrance is worse with the Leap of Faith shit, but besides some tricky platforming at times, there isn't much to nabbing these. And you should nab them because the gem shards are necessary to reach the true ending. But here's a strange thing. The gem shards are the only thing you need. The crystals too, just for the sake of level progression, but the box gems, the time relics, all superfluous things to make a number go up in this game. And that was pretty weird for me. Also a little infuriating because I nearly pulled my ball hair off trying to get the box gems for some of these stages with how long they can be, as some require that you go down the normal and alternate pathways and backtrack through all that shit before you get to a single checkpoint box. The cold hard crash problem basically, combined with the control and graphical issues I mentioned I had before with the huge adventure. Entrance is just as bad at times, inputs not being read, not being able to gauge jumps, enemies being hard to see, and then I find that all that extra work was just for completionist purposes at the end of the game. You piece of shit! I like the boss battles just for the sake of being something a little different. You face off against Crunch and Coco before you snap them out of it. The fight against Fate Crash is pretty interesting because you have to force him into stage hazards since he mimics your every move and he can't be damaged directly. A puzzle boss, not a bad one at that. I wasn't sure what to expect with Entrance. The first form reminds me a little too much of King K. Roll from Donkey Kong Country, but the second form has you bitch slapping him around like a game of Brick Break while Fate Crash lands the finishing blows because he's suddenly a good guy now. Crash's hitbox in this damn helicopter is so large though, dodging these bullets is damn hard if you don't anticipate them beforehand. The true final boss is Entropy, but his fight is almost one-to-one -one the same encounter from Crash 3, which isn't very climactic as far as final bosses go. It's still a solid fight, but you know, I was kind of expecting something a little more. So your friends are saved and the day is saved, with Uka Uka vowing to stop Crash personally next time. There's even this the end for now text at the end, but seeing as the next game is the Spyro crossover, I don't think that vow is ever fulfilled. Well, maybe it is. I haven't actually played Crash Purple, so I'll have to wait and see when, I don't know, when Crash 5 is announced.
Entrance does contain some multiplayer elements, but you need two copies of the game, two Game Boy Advances, a link cable, and all that to even experience it. So obviously, we'll be covering it for this video. But that's cool. You know, maybe one day uh, at a convention, whenever those happen again, <laughs> I'll kidnap Aunt Dude, maybe Caddy. We'll force them into a recording session together. It'd be great. There'll be hors d'oeuvres and shit. Everything will be uncomfortable but we'll get that Entrance multiplayer. For These are fine games, but they're also completely skippable. They have the added novelty of being handheld Crash Adventures that are on a similar level as Crash 2 and Crash 3, but because they borrow so much from those two, music, aesthetics, fuck, even the opening cutscenes from Huge Adventure are just repurposed from Crash 3. Combined with the control and design quirks I went into earlier that makes level progression a little cumbersome, whether you're trying to complete the stage, and especially if you're trying to go for the extra collectibles, even if this game's gimmicks are less intrusive than, say, Wrath of Cortex, I don't really see a need to play these besides saying that you did. They are totally harmless side notes in Crash's extensive platforming career, and ones I can recommend if you literally have nothing else to play. And with that, this little uh, revisit of Crash is going to end with the review of Crash Bandicoot 4 coming out later this week. I have some reservations, but I think there's still a lot to look forward to. Afterwards, we can finally start talking about my next marathon and maybe throw in a couple of bonus videos on top of that. It's close to the end of the year. This is when content creators push hard and try and get those numbers up and all that other shit. You know how it goes. Uh, as always, I'll see you guys for the next video. Thank you all for watching. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear a mask if you decide to go outside. Have yourselves a fantastic night and take care.